that is essentially the diversification space, the risk space that we are building the portfolio inside. And looking at it that way, um, we can visualize every aspect of, of how we are building our heat, the risk that we're taking. We can see the correlation, we can see, we can quantify every aspect of it. Uh, and we have various ways that we, we control the heat inside that space. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome to another episode in the Open Interest Series on Top Traders Unplugged, hosted by Moritz Siebert. In life, as well as in trading, maintaining a spirit of curiosity and open-mindedness is key, and this is precisely what the Open Interest Series is all about. Join Moritz as he engages in candid conversations with seasoned professionals from around the globe to uncover their insights, successes, and failures, offering you a unique perspective on the investment landscape. So with no further ado, please enjoy the conversation. Hi, everyone. I'm Moritz Siebert, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Open Interest on Top Traders Unplugged. Today, I'll be speaking with Gareth Abbott and Richard Little from Baumore Capital, a UK-based trend-following firm. And I've really been looking forward to getting them on the podcast because, truth be told, I had really never heard of Baumore Capital before last summer when a friend mentioned it to me for the first time. And I got really, and I mean big time, really intrigued about how they manage their portfolio, the small number of markets they trade, and of course, their very good performance during 2023, which, as we now all know, wasn't an easy year for most trend-following traders. So, Gareth, Richard, welcome to Open Interest. It's great to have you guys on. And Thank Maritz. you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Maritz. Um, We were just, or I was just mentioning that 2023 was a tough year for trend following trading strategies. And in the, like, we didn't record this, but when we just got onto the recording platform, we were speaking about the start of the year. And I was saying, oh, there's a bunch of funds, you know, that are up three to 4%. And some of the industry benchmark indices, they're maybe slightly positive now. And then, I, you know, I don't want to steal your thunder. He just mentioned to me, oh, you had a fantastic start to the year. So maybe without any you know, too much of any specifics. Um, tell us how your start to the year was. We don't need many positions in this compact portfolio to to drive performance and in a pretty good place with three fairly strong positions uh, driving performance close to 9% so far. So yeah, we're enjoying this month. And, and on the other side, um, you know, typically we can have a majority of of small losing positions and you know that's smaller than usual we don't have many what one position in particular a uh, small position in that gas uh short position that that's off site but um not not particularly big either so yeah we're, we're benefiting really from from three positions across the portfolio one 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 in the stock markets one of the metals and and a soft as well, going to a bit of detail, I suppose, on these. But um, yeah, the, the, there's some of our bigger positions um, that are going, going well. It's a good start to the year because we, you know, like you said, about 23, 2023, we, we, we did have a decent year, but finished, unfortunately, it was a hard December. So actually, it's quite nice to, to bounce back with a, with a really strong, so far, you know, nearly 9% January following that, that December and start the 24 year with a, with a really positive month. As I always like to say, on the 23rd or 24th of January, say we have a, a week still to go. The month is still very young. A lot of things can happen even in the last trading hour of that month. So, but 
Hey, kudos to you. Well done. I think you mentioned short palladium, long cocoa, long the Nikkei. These are all, you know, good positions um, and they've been driving your performance. So congratulations on a good start. Now we immediately jumped into performance, but what I really wanted to do in terms of to, to start out is, you know, your, your backgrounds, which I thought was fascinating because, you know, Gareth, you have a background as a quant and a mathematician, which in our industry isn't all that unusual. And Richard, you have been, used to be a Royal Air Force jet pilot. And, and, and that is the interesting piece. Like, you know, don't tell me it hasn't been exciting and that your new role as CEO of Beaumont Capital is even more exciting than that. Maybe it's safer, but how do you, you know, how does one move from flying jet airplanes in Iraq to running a UK based trend following trading firm? I think it was, uh, you know, there's a lot of, lot of skills crossover, which, which on the surface may not, may not be obvious, but there are a lot of those, those discipline skills, the, um, that we, that, that I bring forward. And to be perfectly honest, yeah, I spent 20 years as a, as a pilot. I flew helicopters for 11 years and then, then jets for 10 ending as a, as a, as a, as a flying instructor. And we have a very well-trodden path within the British military into either commercial aviation or into city jobs with the likes, the large, you know, institutional banks. And I kind of made a decision early on that no civilian flying role is going to be have the level of excitement that I had with those 20 years. I had a fantastic time, but it was time for a new chapter. And I wanted to make that transition into the city, into that traditional world, which we did have a well-trodden, um, should we say, we called the golden handshake, a golden handshake into the likes of Barclays was the one that I was, I was looking into. And through a choice Shall we say series of events? I was introduced to Gareth and Brendan, the the, the trading team of now Bomo. They weren't at the time, and a, a plan was formed. A plan was formed to take the strategy, which is Global Alpha, under a new umbrella, under a new uh, fund structure, a new corporate entity, which became Bomo Capital, of which uh, we put a very tight core team together, specialists in their individual fields, with a very clear goal of making the strategy the sole strategy and allowing it to be open to form far more investors than potentially it previously was. And I took that risk rather than going for the well-trodden path into the city and having a Barclays title next to my name. I thought, well, actually my entrepreneurial spirit, which I've always had through many other ventures, um, I would rather lead this, lead this team. The power of the strategy is evident, the power of the, the team uh, and the trading desk led by by Gareth was evident, um, and really my role was was very. Should we? I won't use the word easy because I think uh, distribution and raising funds is is, as we probably all know, is is one of the hardest uh, roles of getting a new fund off the ground. The strategy speaks for itself, but my role became very much driving uh, distribution, driving um, the the setting up of the fund structure. We were previously a Luxembourg structure then moved it into a Guernsey fund structure which, with all of the, the complexities there. So we were a, a new emerging fund, even if the strategy was a legacy strategy, shall we say, and been running for a number of time, uh, uh, for, for, for a number of years. So that challenge really appealed to me. Uh, and I think it was that challenge that I leaned upon the previous military experience, the handling of the, the, the pressure, the handling of those challenges. And it was using that experience, completely different environment. No longer was I sat in a, in a, in a cockpit at 30,000 feet, but I was actually managing the same level of stress and pressure though, sat behind a desk to get a new fund off the ground, uh, in a new structure and drive AUM in it to our lofty targets, which we still have. So a lot of, should we say crossover skills, um, the challenge I would say has been again on a par. Um, and I thrive in it. And I think the what makes it exciting is not only the strategy. I mean, the strategy which Gareth runs is is phenomenal and really is market leading. But the team we have is small, highly focused, and highly dedicated. And I think that really does make working with Bomo uh, an absolute pleasure. Fantastic, Richard. Now, Gareth, your experience doesn't come from a thirty thousand foot view. Uh, from a cockpit, I think you are more the mathematician by background, at least this is my understanding. And the question I have is, um, you know, a lot of quants, smart mathematicians like yourself, they go into all sorts of areas in finance, like high frequency trading and stead ARP and derivatives trading options, all that. 
why trend following? What, what piqued your interest and, you know, why did it become trend following for you? Yeah, I, I mean, not, not quite as exciting as, as, as Richard has just given us a background, but like you say, uh, it's, it's quite familiar in, a, in our industry. Um, and my, my background is pure mathematics and it, it was a big theme in, in, in our house growing up. Um, my granddad was a mathematician and um, I really got into it with my granddad. He, uh, he was in the shipping industry back in the, the 1950s and 60s. He was a naval architect, also a uh, you know, very in- enthusiastic mathematician. And often that, that's how we would spend our time, mathematics, solving puzzles. Um, was a big theme in the house, that, and sports. So, yeah, gr- growing up, it was always, you know, a, I guess a passion of mine. And, and between mathematics and sports, that, that's really where my interests uh, lay at that point. And I think moving toward trend following, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to just follow my curiosity. Um, I, I didn't really have much career ambition at university. I, I was just enjoying doing pure maths. That that was the, the thing, I guess, that I knew I did want to do. I, I hadn't settled on an application or like, like a lot of my, my friends at the time with, with ideas about doing something commercial, engineering it, it might have been, or for me, it was just enjoying mathematics. And, and that's, that's what I was studying, pure mathematics. And it really sort of came out of the, the blue, uh, the job offer in my final year, which took me on to a trading desk. Uh, and it was a setup. I, I was given a lot of freedom, um, a good budget uh, and discretion to set up a trading desk and set up strategies and really sort of drive the performance. And it didn't take me long to find trend following and immediately really sort of fall in love with it because I, I realized that it really is like like mathematics. It's very pure. It's it's price. That's what we're looking at. And and uh, the the I, I guess as well that there's there's then a lot of consistency between what I had been studying and the the type of mathematics that that I love and trend following this you know, pure analysis pure trend we're, we're just price analysis, uh, following the price and all of the mathematics applied directly to the price series. So I felt for me that it, that it was a really comfortable area that it allowed me to continue thinking that way in, in the world of pure mathematics. Um, and the, the challenge, at, at, you know, that there are many great challenges for mathematics in the universe uh, beating the market has, you know, been my favourite challenge. That's not to say that, that I don't have other interests, but beating the market, I think, is one of the greatest challenges for mathematics. And I've had a lot of fun over the last, coming up for, well, 25 years now, um, facing that challenge. When you say it's a challenge for mathematics, it almost sounds like there is a solution. There is like, you know, at the end of the equation, there is, that's the answer. That's the solution. That is how you beat the markets. But I guess that's not exactly like that, is it? Well, uh, I guess this brings in the whole concept of, of having a, a robust approach, you know, that the, 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 there's not the, the perfect answer, the, the, the idea of the Holy Grail. It's having that approach which can endure through thick and thin, um, that, that makes sense. It, it ought to work when the conditions are favorable and it ought to manage unfavorable conditions. So, yeah, for, for, for me, th- there is an answer, you know, and, and in our system design, that, that, theme of pure mathematics runs right through the system. You know, the, the design around all aspects is functional uh, rather than 
um, iterative or, you know, we, we, we avoid optimization, estimations, iteration. And, and yeah, I've approached it with my, my own strengths, pure mathematics and looking at everything uh, from a functional analysis point of view and, and finding exact solutions. <laughs> I guess, I guess keeping <laughs> losing trout small and letting the winners run is part of the answer to that equation of, um, solving the market puzzle. But um, Richard, maybe let me bring it back to you. You've mentioned your fund and the launch in Guernsey or the migration from Luxembourg to Guernsey. Maybe tell us a little bit more about that Global Alpha Fund, I think it's called, which you launched in the summer of last year. Um, what does it trade? How does it trade? Is it pure trends? Just the high-level summary of that product. Absolutely. And and again, the the, the we are, we are a single strategy fund so it is exactly as you say it's the global alpha fund which um, is run out of guernsey uh under northern trust we trade 21 markets and the intricacies and the the whys and the the wares of the 21 very much is is left i'll leave for gareth but we trade only 21 markets of pure trend and unlike our our uh, competitors and, and our peers who may trade hundreds of markets we are the anomaly, shall we say, with only 21. And I'm quite sure that's where this conversation will lead because it is a bit of a USP of ours. And once Gareth explains the why, we generally find um, investors and those knowledgeable in the space, actually their eyes generally open to think, well, actually, yes, I can now understand why you've got so few markets, vice the hundreds others may, may trade. So yes, we trade 21 markets. We cover all um, sectors of the global economy from the metals, the stock markets, the softs, um, um, et cetera. And we could go into the, the, the specifics, if you wish, of, of those 21. I'm more than happy to, uh, to list them off. But ultimately, we, we work it around what, what we refer to as a MISI portfolio construction, where we're mutually exclusive, but collectively exhaustive, hence maximizing diversification. And simply put, it's those carefully selected markets in an optimal, an optimal number of markets to cover, like I say, every sector across the, 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 the global economy. They're highly liquid markets and they're selected exactly for that. So they are the 21, should we call them most liquid markets, meaning that we're never going to be left with it in a position um, where liquidity for the fund may become an issue. So to briefly cover what we've got, we cover indices. So we've got Eurostox, Dow, and the Nikkei will cover interest rates. So we've got the SOFA, the Euro bond, and the US long bond. We've got currencies. We cover British pound, Canadian dollar, Aussie dollar, metals, gold, copper, palladium, energy, crude, heating oil, and nat gas. We cover grains, corn, and soybean, softs, cocoa, and coffee, and finally livestock, live cattle, and lean hog. And then obviously, the portion in cash. So they are the 21 giving us that, like I say, that MISI portfolio construction. Um, so you teed yeah. it, uh, you, you teed the golf ball up for me very nicely. And thanks for that, Richard. By the way, I just listened to the the markets that you've mentioned there. Wheat is missing. There's no wheat contract uh, you're trading. Or did I, did I miss that? I'll, I'm not sure. But why, look, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, this is exactly where that conversation is going to go. And I hope it's going to be interesting. Blackjack 21, why 21, why not 22, why not 20, why not 30, why not 40? How did you come up with this MECE, MEC, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive, I think you called it, a group of markets? The, the, there's a symmetry in, in the design and, and a good balance. Uh, with, with the 21 markets, Rich has summarized, we, we cover all eight sectors we, we only do the two grains. Uh, we, we, we do corn and soy. We, we left wheat on the uh, subs bench. Uh, we, we brought the two softs in, so we do coffee and cocoa and two livestock, cattle and hogs. And adding a third in, in, in each of those sectors sh sure can be done, and, and there is liquidity, but we feel that we have the balance with the nine out-and-out -out financial markets nine out and out commodity markets and the three metals which make up the the overall 21 sort of proxy both because we've got a blend of precious and industrial so we have that 
even balance, there's an equal allocation to financial and commodity. T touching on the, the BC theme, this is really powerful for us because it's not just the portfolio, the, the strategy is a MEC trend following strategy and no doubt one of our strengths. The, the strategy is driven by MEC system and portfolio construction. So it's not just the portfolio uh, designed to minimize correlation and maximize diversification, which is quite simply what that means in this case. Uh, minimum correlation, maximum diversification. So we have a broad and comprehensive approach to trend following beyond just going out in the markets. So our system-driven processes, portfolio construction, we combine a highly efficient trend capture, which I think we're going to talk about with, with the traditional conservation of capital to produce our edge. Uh, this, this is what drives the mathematical expectancy, which... Any, any strategy requires to be profitable. Positive mathematical expectancy is required. Quite simply put, profits must frequently outweigh losses. And in the case of trend following, that's, that's typically a low win rate and a high profit rate. Um, now, the, the greater the efficiency of the trend capture, again, we hopefully come on to this, the greater the mathematical expectancy, that's one of the cornerstones, one of the foundations of the system is the efficiency of the trend capture, uh, which, as I say, drives drive the uh, the edge of the mathematical expectancy, which is key. You know, that is ultimately the key. With that in place, it comes down to how to back your edge and how to manage risk, essentially. But on the portfolio side, First of all, the, the idea of the MISI portfolio we've, we've, we've touched on there, it, it's a highly liquid construction, as Rich describes. The, the portfolio constituents are the highest global liquidity, major mark, macroeconomic markets. It's, it's a carefully selected minimum number of markets for the portfolio. Why minimum? Well, in order to value the impact of every trade, and avoid dilution of the system. We want to value the system, value what we do, value our trend capture. We cover every sector, every region around the, the global economy. And like I say, it's equally weighted across financial and commodity markets. But with this compact diversification in the markets and such a strong internal diversification with the system strategy, the reliance on even just a single market trend to drive portfolio performance is very important to us. One strong trend can generate all of our returns while we simply deal with the background noise. Positions are weighted to offset a normalised daily movement across non-trending markets like a noise cancelling effect in the background. So we build our, our positions in, in these uh, normalised units so that a good day in, in a stock market can offset a bad day in a soft market. And what that means is, is that we achieve this noise cancelling effect, non-trending positions will we'll cancel one another out while performance is, is driven by our, our strong positions, our, our, you know, the, the trends that we capture. Uh, and like I say, just just one can can drive the entire portfolio performance, which is something that we value greatly. Let's maybe take this in two steps, and we'll definitely get into the efficient trend capture and the things you do there, Gareth. And thank you for the explanation so far. Now you've mentioned, or I think you've mentioned. Correct me if if I'm saying that wrong. That maybe more markets might be diluting your returns. Um, now, you as the mathematician, I mean, we we understand that there is a marginal diversification benefit to be had by adding additional markets to the portfolio. So if you increased it from 21 to 22 to 30 to 40 to 50, all the way to 100, I guess, or more, you would have an additional diversification benefit, which is there for you to grab. You can have that, right? It would 
theoretically improve the risk-adjusted returns, which means you can trade your portfolio in a different way, um, size positions differently. And you decided to not do that. And and this is this is this is kind of difficult. You said it's your USP, but it's difficult to square that up um, mathematically. So maybe explain to us why trading 21 markets is better than trading a hundred markets and, or, or maybe start with, I, I, I presume you have run your system unchanged on more markets, just add them to the system, add them to the code and let the system run. What happens? Does, doesn't it perform better? No, no. I mean, we, we can, we can improve sharp if that's important. What's most important for, for us is, is the return profile of the system. We, we're looking to double capital in every economic cycle in a robust way. Uh, so every three to five years, we want to see, we want to, that, that, we want that to be our double rate. We want to double capital every three to five years and are quite happy to see a maximum drawdown of around about 20% through each cycle. So I'm, I'm, I'm not all that concerned with sharp ratio. There's, in many ways, it doesn't make sense to me, this combination of, of risk and reward. I like to look at them separately. I like to look at return and risk in, in many ways. And, and separately, there's very few metrics that I, I feel combine um, both these concepts well. We, 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 do look, we do look at um, some Z scores ourselves, but... Um, I don't really value sharp ratio. Um, and that's really the only thing that I can see improve at the point where we go for um, that scale of diversification in the market. It, it's not the only way to diversify. And, and for me, it's not, it's not the most valuable way to diversify either. We, we value the internal system diversification more than just adding markets. This is what we call smart pyramiding or whole trend. I, I could perhaps try and explain it in a couple of ways. Oh yeah, especially the smart pyramiding. That that sounds very intriguing. Yeah. Um, I mean, pure trend is, is out there. It's pretty well understood. There's different interpretations of it. For us, it expresses our 100% commitment to trend following. Um, and we know that, that, that trend following price trends um, are a clear, repeatable source of alpha for for a robust system. Price trends, the, the trend alpha is systemic. It's based trend following works because it's based on how the economy works, and there's few more solid sources of alpha than than trend alpha. Like I say, it's systemic. It comes from from how our economy works. the The idea of whole trend. This expresses the MISI commitment to maximum trend capture and to maximize the, the mathematical expectancy as far as possible with the most efficient trend capture that, that, that we can achieve. We're looking for maximum price movement and profit across all markets. And we, we've, we've, we've committed more to that area, to that efficiency of achieving the maximum price movement, the capture and profit across the markets we trade before we just add more markets with a multi-strategy, multi-frequency system. This is the idea of the smart pyramiding. So we're, we're casting as broad a net as we can across the markets that we trade and we, we, we trade multi-strategy, multi-frequency for strategies across four frequencies, you know, and, the, and these are established industry methodologies that we've upgraded. They're based on simple mathematics, all trend following, all in different ways. And this composes an internal diversification space within the system to diversify and pyramid every trade. So rather than, than simply trailing stops is, is a good example. You know, we, we use stop losses, but not stop profits. The exits are consistent with the entries and are determined by this smart pyramid. 
So the diversification that we can achieve this way with the smart pyramid, we have the four strategies on four frequencies gives us 16 individual strategies, all trend following, all in different ways. And and there we have the diversification to capture different price structures, the the, the many different types of trends um, in, in all these markets. That That is the probably what you mean with the smart pyramiding. As you have said, it is this combination of systems. You have, I think, a total of four model types, if you will, and then four timeframes. The total of that is 16 systems. When you combine them, you essentially have this layered approach, which we could say pyramids you into position, but it is not, say, the original definition of a pyramid whereby you would add to a winning position and just become larger and larger and larger and maybe adjust the stop. You would simply, you know, trade another time frame or have another model come in. And I'd like to really speak to you about that and 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 to you, Richard, as well. We'll tie you in 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 a sec. Just final thing on the markets and and prediction around markets. You've made the decision to trade 21. You've made a decision to trade, say, the Nikkei index, I think you've mentioned at the beginning of the show, and not the DAX index and not the FTSE index. Why is that? Did you look at the performance? And I'm asking there, there's a background to my question. So background is, if you analyzed your return stream and you found that there is a set of markets that have better and more persistent, statistically significant and persistent trending properties, then you could arguably say that you only want to trend follow these markets. Say the Nikkei is, you know, 2x or 3x better uh, in terms of return output than the DAX index. Then you could say that you don't want to be trading the DAX index at all, and you will be committing all your risk budget to the Nikkei index as a result of that. And there are some market participants, trend following traders in our industry who do that in the alternative market space, um, deliberately removing the traditional markets from their portfolios because they say they have inferior trending properties and they replace them with these alternative markets where they say that they have higher sharps or higher risk adjusted trend follower returns but to me, and, and I respect that decision, but that is also kind of like making a prediction that that persistency will continue in the future, that what you have observed there will also be true going forward. That to me is always a difficulty with you know, predictions in general, because I really don't know which of these fantastic markets that we trade are going to be throwing us off these great trading opportunities. Um, it might be Coco, it might be sugar, it might be the DAX, it might be for once in a while the, the, the FTSE index, who knows? So to what extent did that play a role when you looked at these markets? I mean, how did you decide which ones to exclude? And and is there kind of like the thinking there that, you know, the markets that you trade, they just had maybe produced the best returns in the past and, and therefore you've selected them for your portfolio and you threw the other ones out? How How did you form that portfolio when you view it through that lens we didn't in any way optimize any aspect of the strategy the system or the portfolio no question we could select 21 markets which would massively outperform what we have here but that's that's just not the way that 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 the system has been designed you know we through testing, we, we've we've always required that the system would perform given a reasonable sample of markets. You know, this, the, the system will perform well, okay, uh, going back to the sharp ratio, uh, that, that, that might not hold up so well if that's important. But, you know, given, given eight markets, just a proxy from each sector. So that that's always been a requirement through all the the, the system design and testing, is the system must perform given a reasonable sample of markets and and will do. You know, if we we run the system on one for each sector, eight markets, performance is good. Um, Even fewer markets than that, if if we 
uh, get some sort of diversification between financial and commodity. We wanted to avoid the portfolio looking like we had cherry picked as well, which is why there are no surprises in there. So, for example, in the stock markets, we we we've gone for the the multi region major markets. So we we've gone for Euro stocks for Europe. We've gone for the Dow in the States. That could have been S and P. Um, Nasdaq would likely outperform them both. And we've gone for Nikkei in Asia uh, and, and typically Hang Seng would outperform there. So we wanted to demonstrate the power of the system, uh, w- which we feel this portfolio does very well. And there's no question, like, like you say, that, that, that there are bigger returns up for grabs in s- some, some of, of, of the, the s- smaller more obscure markets. A good example would be Bitcoin. There's, there's no question that the system likes Bitcoin, right? If we throw Bitcoin in there instead of something like Canadian dollar, yeah, you know, that 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 has a big performance impact. And maybe that's for a later product. Maybe we 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 will take that view and and, and have a a more risk seeking product in the future. But the purpose of Global Alpha is to have a very solid product. Uh, it, it's all major market and demonstrate the system capability. Like I say, that the, the system will perform given a reasonable sample of markets. It doesn't need to look for that extra alpha that is out there in, in you know many of these um, less liquid markets. Sure, we we can never be sure and. Neither can you be sure that you have the best set of markets because you very likely will never have the best set of markets. So in your case, a simple test would be if you replace the Nikkei or the Eurostox or the Dow, I think you've mentioned with um, whatever the Australian stock index, the FTSE and, and the Canadian stock index, and you replaced your, uh, your palladium with platinum and your heating oil with gasoline. You, have another set of 21 markets, performance will be different. But what you're saying is no matter how you slice and dice it, every single one of these portfolio combinations over time will have a positive expectancy. I mean, all, all, all I guess I feel strongly about in that regard is that we give some consideration to the diversification, you know. So again, just sticking with the stock markets, the, the, the Euro stocks is in there as a proxy for Europe, the Dow for America and the Nikkei for Asia. So, you know, like for like changes just just to maintain the diversification. And we do daily monitor we do monitor and track, you know, well over a well over a hundred markets. But to swap in and out is not something that is that is taken lightly. But we have looked at the past in the past and and we are currently at, at present as well, where we look intricately at one specific market and decide whether it's better placed to fill that slot in the portfolio. And what Gareth mentioned is you know, on my, you know, my aspiration, certainly within, I'd like to, to, we are currently testing what we refer to as a, as a wild card. So again, 21 less liquid, more volatile markets that, that could offer something different to an investor, but core global alpha, like I've mentioned that we are single strategy fund, but I would like in time, potentially this year to almost launch a, a, a higher volatility, a higher vol- uh, product on less liquid markets to offer the investor those, like you said, like Gareth said, those risk-seeking investors, potentially people who've already been invested in core or core offering, uh, an opportunity to uh, to step into something uh, a little that offers a little bit more potential reward, but also uh, is a little bit more volatile. That's on the whiteboard. We're looking at the markets that we would use in that, um, and that's quite an exciting project that we're working on. Um, we've, we've carried out a lot of testing on it. Hopefully we'll be looking to launch a, an internal managed account shortly to, uh, to put that live. And then, then who knows, Bowmore might have that as a, as an offering within the next 12 months. Well, interesting. Looking forward to that. Um, really final point on this and, and either Richard or Gareth, but, um, when you think about the equity markets, you've mentioned the Euro stocks and you trade the Euro stocks as say the proxy for the, well, the European equity markets. And say you you risk 
X on the Euro stocks. Um, now you could trade the DAX index, the Kakara, the IBEX, the SMI, and say the FTSE, these are five stock indices from Europe. And you could now risk one fifth of X, your original risk budget of X, you know, risk one fifth of, of each of them. That would give you the same exposure, but at slightly different points in time, because there is this bit of a diversification benefit that does exist between these markets. So IBEX is, I guess, performing a bit stronger than whatever the Euro stocks this year or, or the last couple of months, I don't know. That, that to me is something that's out there that you could take that wouldn't be creating a dilution to your returns because you'd still be getting onto these big trends and you'd still be risking the full amount eventually a full X. You see see the point? Sure. I mean, as we consistently take that approach across the portfolio and trade more markets in each sector, then we do start to dilute the, the, the impact of an individual market trade. That's, that's not to say that that approach is not effective and Trading hundreds of markets can work, can have a good uh, risk uh, return profile. It's not for us. It's not for us in this pro product. Like I say, we, we, we really value the internal diversification more than just adding markets. And we, we value the system, what we do, and, and the impact of an individual market trade is very important. That is the other thing. I, I think you have put a lot of value, and I do agree with that, on system diversification. So you have diversification that stems from the market's selection, and you have the diversification that you get from trading ac across different time frames and different system types. And maybe, Richard, we've already touched on the 16. Um, maybe you can give us a bit more of a high-level overview of the time frames and the model types that you run there. And I'll probably leave the model types to uh, to Gareth. But the six the the, the timeframes we look at are are not optimized in any way, and they are they are simply based on Dow theory being a month, a quarter, half yearly, and yearly being the timeframes. And the reason we don't optimize them quite simply is, and uh, it is only optimized. And, you know, we may optimize it, but it's only optimized until the time a, a further optimal. Maybe, maybe presence. Therefore, sticking to the Dow theory timeframes is, is something that Gareth's been uh, very key. Now, those four timeframes are then coupled with four models looking, for, and, and they are the models which are used for the entry and the exit signals. Uh, Gareth, high level, do you want to touch on the, on the four models that you use or the four indicators that you use coupled with those four timeframes? Sure, yes. Uh, again, we're, we're, we're on this idea of whole trend and smart pyramiding and you know, most of the, and we've, we've spoken about the systemic source of alpha, the trend alpha, most of the original pure trend CTEs were driven out, panic reaction to, to market conditions like, like 2010 uh, and victims of, of their own huge success in many cases. Tr trend following was easy money in the early days. For over 40 years, all of the classic single strategies had proven ro robust individually. In fact, every single global alpha strategy had outperformed on its own. Th this is very important to combine the two, you know, that the, when, when conditions get tough for, for a pure trend approach is when whole trend gets going and the combination w will deliver the, the, the alpha, the clear repeatable alpha, the, the edge that we need. The system, like we say, the diversification isn't just across markets. We have a 3D dynamic diversification. So there's a smart, precise position weighting. This is based on real mathematics rigor. This is where it comes in. We touched on the, the market strategy uh, a, a moment ago. The, these are the three key components of the system, the portfolio allocation, the risk management, and the market strategy. The market strategy is based on pretty simple mathematics. The portfolio allocation, talk a bit just now, and the risk management is where the rigor comes in. As that's where some real, real, you know, grown-up mathematics comes in. So that 
the 3D dynamic diversification, this is dynamic allocation across a, a three-dimensional diversification space, which is like a prism. The, the dimensions are multi-strategy, multi-frequency, and multi-market, which we've touched on. The multi-strategy theme is, is very different established trend-following methodology. And I'll explain about about these. That's that's really, I guess, what the question is at the moment. Uh, as well as multi-frequency, this is the, the Dow theory, primary, secondary, and minor trends. So ac across the, the multi-strategy diversification, we're running four main trend-following strategies, all, like I say, trend-following all in different ways. Two of them are breakout event-driven strategies, which are very price-sensitive and, and uh, will react at a signal, uh, will trigger based on one significant price movement. The other two are evolving autoregressive strategies based on lags, so less sensitive to one in in individual price sample uh, based on, on, on the analysis of lags. And in combination, this allows us to capture many different price and trend structures because, as we know, they're always different. You know, f even within the same market, one trend to the next can be very, very different. They can be similar. Um, you can see similar patterns across markets, but you have to be prepared for one trend to the next being very, very different. Um, it, it could be very aggressive, very volatile. It could, move, you know, most of that movement could take place in a very volatile way over a short period of time. Uh, and in other, other cases, these trends can be very stable and slow and uh, evolve over many years. And and with the the four very different strategies, we we can capture uh, many different types of trend structures. These. Four strategies are then applied over four frequencies. In, in, in line with Dow theory, that's just a consistent application of Dow theory. We apply the strategies over a primary trend time frame, uh, twice over secondary trend time frames, and then on a minor trend look back as well. And, and none of these look back periods are optimized in any way. I spoke earlier about um, the, the avoidance of, of optimizing in any aspect of the system. And this is a good example. We, we haven't optimized any of our look backs. We are, we are looking at the look back periods, which are consistent with the economy that, that we work and live by. So we're looking at um, a year to multi year. We're looking at six months, we're looking at three months, and we're looking at a month. Quite quite simply, calendar look back periods. Now, in combination, th this, this is how we achieve the smart pyramid. We, we can pyramid in and out of positions with this combination of multi-strategy, multi-frequency trading. The exits are consistent with the entries. We don't just trail stops. We, we only use stops to stop loss, not to stop profits. So we limit the downside, unlimit the upside, um, and exits, which which is all, all always um, seems to be an interesting talking point about the system. The exits are consistent with the entries. So if we have entered a trade based on a donkey in channel or a moving average cross, then that's how we'll exit the trade. The stops will be placed simply to to limit the the entry risk, the, the the loss of the trade, not to take profit. And in this way, we achieve the the outcome of the Spark Pyramid, and we, we can capture the many different types of trend structures, which simply trailing stops doesn't do very well. It doesn't allow the same freedom, uh, which logically is consistent with how the entry decisions were made. If you enter based on 
a linear slope, it's sensible to exit based on that same slope. Uh, and like I say, we, we, we leave the stops just to, uh, to limit loss, the entry risk. Coming back to the smart permitting, I guess when you say run each model or each system on one sixteenth of risk, you would have that result, right? Because every model has a one sixteenth footprint, if you will, um, some trades faster, some trade slower. And then over time, they would add to an established position and they would also remove from an existing position, given the fact that they're trading across different time frames. But you've also mentioned, Gareth, that the, the grown up mathematics, they come in within that prism of markets diversification, time frame diversification and model diversification. So that suggests it is not a simple like linear addition of one sixteenth of risk, but there's something else going on that you do with a portfolio as it's being built or as you're, you know, having, as you're holding these positions. Um, what's that about? Yeah, we, we spoke about this before, didn't we? And, um, I think this is p perhaps uh, a different way about, um, looking at risk, which, um, we, we can get right into, Let, let's, give it a go and see how far we, we go with this. But th this, I guess, is is our view here is that Global Alpha can stand the heat. Um, so, so our distributed risk, our heat, is managed inside a 3D risk diversification space like a prism, the risk brick, um, which we, we've already just been touching on there where we have the, the space is formed in the three dimensions, we have four strategies, four frequencies. So that gives us a surface of 16 points of diversification. And those points are the units which we, we, we build the position with. And that's how we build our heat. That surface is then applied across 21 markets. So it, it creates this prism. You know, if we're looking at the front surface, four strategies, four frequencies, the 16 units there, uh, and then the depth of, of 21 markets gives us a, a diversification space with a volume of 336 units. And these units are the building blocks. The portfolio is constructed to precision scale within the three dimensions of strategy, frequency, and market containing heat or risk space within strict limits of risk, equity, and margin, uh, and with infinite capacity, in theory, anyway, as positions, as the position unit size can tend towards CEO contracts. So we apply the heat risk controls in this risk diversification space to improve risk-adjusted return um, and like I say, we construct the portfolio to precision scale within this three-dimensional space. So I suppose it's a slightly different way of looking at it. You know, we look at the efficiency of the space, like I say, with with the, uh, the dimensions of four strategies, four frequencies across 21 markets, that there's 336 units in there. That's the volume uh, in which we can build the risk. The surface area is 368 units. So we've got a very high efficiency of, of the space to begin with. There's a 91% heat efficiency there when we compare the volume to surface area, which would be much lower in cases where you, you are, uh, a system has less internal diversification. If it's a single strategy approach, trading, you know, one one type of, of trend following strategy on one frequency, whether many uh, CTEs would, would take that approach or not, but that would be a, a very inefficient um, space, risk space with, you know, with a, a much lower, fall, fall down to closer to 25%, that efficiency number, comparing the, the volume to the surface area of, of that diversification space. So it then becomes about how we control the heat inside that space. That's that's how I look at it. You know, I, I look at it from the outside in. That that is essentially the 
diversification space, the risk space that we are building the portfolio inside and looking at it that way, um, we can visualize every aspect of, of how we are building our heat, the risk that we're taking. We can see the correlation. We can see, we can quantify every aspect of it. Uh, and we have various ways. I'm quite happy to, to go into these ways that we, we control the heat inside that space. Let's, let's do this a little bit before we do that, Gareth, we need to define what heat is. You know, I think it comes from say Coda and Drews and Drews. So heat is the, essentially the risk or the equity at risk initially. And then also depending on how you view it as the trade develops. So the risk to stop, if you will, is this, is this your definition of it as well? Or what do you mean when you speak about heat in the portfolio? Yeah. Um, you know, it's the, the, the total distributed risk. So for us, the, the positions, uh, the total di distributed risk in strict 3D limits, the positions build accurately and the risk to scale in market generic normalized units. So it's, it's how we distribute our risk in terms of building in the, the units. Um, uh, so, so I guess uh, an example of that would be with the, the, the 16 units provided by the four strategies across the four frequencies. And at the point where all 16 units build the position, we call that a fully loaded position. We have one at the moment, uh, the position we have in palladium. We have a short palladium position, which is fully loaded. So all 16 units are short. In that case, the four strategies across the four frequencies are, are all short. In, in that sense, that's how we, we view the heat within this diversification prism. We, we look at how we're building units across the portfolio. And in the case of palladium, that would be a full layer. So I presume palladium now has a lot of heat in your portfolio relative to say, I don't know, um, that gas, I think you've mentioned initially, where you have a little bit of an offside position. I think you've uh, you've used that word. At, I mean, is there is there like a dynamic or ongoing adjustment of that heat going on between markets in the sense that, say, the palladium heat or the palladium equity at risk risk to stop becomes too large? You would reduce that position to control that heat, reduce it and move it somewhere else? Or is that something that you would refuse to do? There's a combination of both aspects there. So whilst the position in palladium itself is, is built by the smart pyramid, and in this case, all 16 units are short, at the same time, the, the risk per unit is, is controlled um, in, in a simple way by the bet size itself so there's there's a bet size um w within every unit so the, the unit equates to a determined bet size this calibrates the risk per unit um and one of the aspects there is the very familiar methodology of of volatility normalizing so if um in the case of palladium the market became more volatile then the unit size, the position size of that unit would decrease to uphold the target return. So it's the, the same idea of, and it's ATR based, these units are volatility normalized so that the, the, the outcome or the target outcome in any event is that a unit in palladium will move the same each day on average as, you know, in dollar terms, as an as a unit in gas. Albeit those positions are different in size at the moment because, like I say, Palladium, we're, we're fully loaded, short 16 units, and the, the short position in gas is only five units. But those units are, are volatility normalized in a very similar way to the, the, the you know, methodology that 
many people will be familiar with just ATR based volatility normalization. Sure. It, 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 you know, normalizes expected losses through the initial position sizing. Um, what we don't know is the outcome to the upside because we leave that open. Um, an interesting pointer is like, you know, when you initially size the position, uh, bases, the ATR, um, so that they have that same loss expectation. That is, that is to me a kind of like, that is one bet. That is one hand that I'm playing at that blackjack table that the markets give us. And I kind of like encapsulate that bet and leave it alone, which means it'll either going to be stopped out or it'll find its exit at some point in time. But an interesting question is always, is there added value or an edge that you can add to that initial position sizing by dynamically adjusting that initial position size over time as the trade progresses as a function of changing ATR, changing volatility, changing correlation, changing, you know, distributed portfolio, eat all that type of stuff, which is it is an interesting point because these methods, these overlays, usually aren't rested on a sound trend following footing. They they have essentially a different signal generation process, right? That doesn't stem from trend. It comes from second derivative price dynamics. So is is that something that you do? Or like do you see edge and alpha there? Is is that important? Could you just run your 16 systems in a linear fashion, stack them on top of each other and also get great results? I get the, the idea of the balance between accuracy, system accuracy and micro tinkering. You know, I, I guess the more you try and factor in, the more micro tinkering, the, the more the risk of, of uh, getting whipsawed essentially versus, you know, and, and the robust approach to, to avoid micro tinkering too much and, and trying to be too accurate, uh, versus having a, a robust level of system accuracy. We, we do dynamically adjust the position, you know, and, and that, uh, the ATR is a good example. So based on the, the volatility of the market, we dynamically adjust the, the position size, the size of a unit. Just again, to target that outcome, the, the units are generic, market generic, normalized units moving approximately the same in, in risk terms, even in dollar terms each day so that we achieve the noise cancelling effect across the portfolio that a good day in one market will offset a bad day in the other and that performance over time is is driven by the the trends even like i say just one strong trend can drive performance while um the rest of the positions can can cancel each other out if this nor normalization is is accurate and in the case of the the ATR dynamic adjustment. So quite simply, if the ATR it, it is to, to go up, the, the position size, the size of a unit is reduced so that we stay on target for that, that daily movement of a, of, of a unit that that's reflected in the stops as well. So in, in the case of the ATR expanding the stop would expand and the position would be reduced. And it works the other way around, you know, as the ATR uh, reduces or contracts, stops come in, p p position size increases. And, and again, it's to achieve the outcome of normalizing volatility across all the markets, which for me is, is, is a very powerful aspect of, of risk management. Now, if we didn't do that, would the system still work? I mean, absolutely. This is more for me a point on system accuracy, improving accuracy, improving efficiency, and the performance profile. You know, rather than it being a, a necessary aspect of of the system for performance, it's 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 more of a performance driver. 
Fantastic. Gareth, Richard, I think we should leave it there. It has been a lot. Um, I found it really interesting. Listeners, I hope you found it interesting also. Um, quite some different takeaways and nuggets that we've heard from, from Balmore Capital today. So thank you very much, Gareth and Richard, for joining me today. It's been really great to have you on the podcast. Um, really enjoyed that. And listeners, as usual, you can find Gareth and Richard's contact and social media information in our show notes. And please send us an email, info at toptradersunplugged.com, if you have any questions about the things we discussed today. So Gareth, Richard, maybe in a year's time or sooner or a bit later, we'll uh, reconvene on that show and review 2024 and how you guys have fared. I definitely do wish you all the best. Um, also with your, uh, the new fund project that you have, the, the new higher volatility, Balmore and steroids uh, <laughs> fund that you're working on. Again, thanks very much for being on today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.